Hello FF7 fans. Now, this is something I've wanted to do for a while now. If you're a long time subscriber to the channel, you may remember a series of Final Fantasy VII Know The Facts videos that I released starting all the way back in 2015. These videos are old, low resolution and stuck in the depth of YouTube, but they do have hundreds of absolutely amazing facts about one of the best games ever made, Final Fantasy VII. To celebrate the release of FF7 Rebirth, I've completely remade this entire series and put them together into one meaty video. There are some seriously unbelievable facts regarding the original Final Fantasy VII here and I guarantee that you will not know all of them. This is Final Fantasy VII All The Facts where we look at all of the facts, secrets, references and easter eggs that you may not know about this classic. And yes, there will be spoilers from the original 1997 release, so if somehow you don't know about a certain thing that happens, maybe don't watch this video. Before we get into it, if you liked this video, it would help me out a lot to hit that like button and sub for more FF and JRPG content coming soon. And you can hit that super thanks if you'd like to support the channel. I would also love to hear from you. What facts did you find the most interesting or did I miss anything good? Let me know in the comments below. Alright, let's get into it. Let's start with the early days. Final Fantasy VII's development commenced in 1994, just after Final Fantasy VI was released. Initial plot ideas suggested that the setting would be New York City in 1999 and would follow the adventures of a hero called Hot Blooded Detective Joe. He would set out to stop the terrorist activities of the main characters. Sorceress Edia was also going to make an appearance, as were Rajan and Fujin who were later replaced by the Turks. These characters of course later appeared in FF. Fate. At one stage, the game was going to use 2D pixel based graphics. There is one concept image early in the development featuring an isometric view that uses Final Fantasy VI character designs including Loki. Shortly after this, Square decided that 3D was the way to go and they developed the experimental 3D demo that also featured Final Fantasy VI's characters. This demo was created to show what FF7 would look like on the N64 but they later walked the PlayStation path as the CD-ROM media was more relaxed aligned with her vision. This was of course a decision that massively hurt the Nintendo console due to FF7 selling more than 10 million copies. However, Sony felt that gaining FF7 as an exclusive wasn't quite enough and decided to rub it in just a little bit more. In a magazine advertisement for FF7, some of the text reads, Someone please get the guys who make cartridge games a cigarette and a blindfold. And good thing if it were available on cartridge, it'd retail for $1,200. Yep, I am starting to feel like I'm in high school again. Final Fantasy VII has had a lot of spin-off titles over the years, some that pleased fans and some that didn't. Have you noticed that the anagrams of each spin-off title follows a pattern? AC, BC, CC and DC. What's even cooler is that the most recent spin-off also follows this trend with EC. With the remake trilogy following our names, what do you think will be in store for the next FF spin-off? Future Children? First Cetra? Fabulous Carrots? Only time will tell. Hironobu Sakaguchi is a legend to so many Final Fantasy fans. The Rocket Town Inn has a nice little tribute to the creator of Final Fantasy. On the back wall in one of the rooms, you'll see a portrait of him. What a legend! There's also a poster at the Icicle Inn that very closely resembles the Bahamut Lagoon logo, which is another one of Squaresoft's Super Nintendo RPGs. Now it's time to talk about that scene. Remember, you've had your spoiler warning. During the defining cutscene when Sephiroth kills Aerith, Sephiroth's hands are bare as he descends from the ceiling. However, during the rest of the scene, he has black gloves on. Uh, I guess he wanted to cover his tracks. Speaking of Aerith, it is very possible that she was either initially going to die later in the game or be revived at some point. There is some unused game content in Disc 2 and 3 which heavily implies that at some time in development she would have been alive at that point in time, such as this line of dialogue that can be accessed if you use a cheat device to bring her back to life. And I'm sure you've all seen that glitch slash ghost of Aerith when returning to the church in Disc 1. What's with that? Now, it's pretty well known that Final Fantasy VII's English translation was not good. Here's some examples that you might not know about. 
During the motorcycle chase FMV, Midgar is incorrectly spelt Midgar on the side of the truck door. This is probably because the letters R and L are commonly mistranslated from Japanese to English. And safe for Sephiroth? What, was he wearing a deployable airbag? It is widely agreed that this was meant to be Seraph Sephiroth. Bizarro Sephiroth was also a mistranslation of Rebirth Sephiroth. Bizarro? Rebirth? Not sure how they messed that one up. And of course, the most aggravating mistake of all. Somehow, Aerith turned into Aeris for the US release. And did you know that Aerith's name is not stated once in Advent Children? Instead, she's referred to as her, she, or you. This is no doubt due to the division among fans over the correct pronunciation. Her name was, however, written as Aerith in the end credits. One Winged Angel, such an amazing track. I can't help but rock out to this every single time I hear it. Did you know that One Winged Angel was inspired by the intro to the song Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix? See the resemblance? Here's a couple of facts about our least favourite main character in Final Fantasy VII. Oh wait, did I say that out loud? You may think that Kite Sith made his debut in Final Fantasy VII, but in fact, his first appearance was in FF6 as the Aspera Stray. You see, Stray was actually named Kite Sith in the original Japanese version. With that said, various re-releases of older Final Fantasy games have new enemies named Kite Sith. But what does this name actually mean? No, he's not a Sith Lord unfortunately. The name comes from Celtic mythology and means fairy cat. One of the FF7 programmers decided that it was a good idea to write in a bit of code to his wife. A file found on disc 3 states the following. Great special thanks to you Ariko from your husband Hideji. Oh, how sweet. The Buster Sword is such an iconic weapon. Originally, it was a lot smaller and thinner and was designed to only have one materia slot. It was also originally visioned as unrefined steel and nicknamed the Giant Kitchen Knife. Ah uh, yeah, Buster Sword is much more intimidating. But have you ever wondered how this giant sword sticks to Cloud's back? Some early concept art shows that his sword was meant to be held on his back with magnets. Still, that's gotta be bad for the back. And check this out, the guys from Men at Arms crafted a full scale replica. They also created Sephiroth's Masamune, seriously cool. How many geeks out there are having nerdgasms right now? You mean including us? <laughs> President Shinra was actually a bit of a slut. We learnt in Crisis Core that he had an illegitimate son named Lazard with a woman from the slums. What most people don't know is that in the novel Final Fantasy VII Lateral Biography Turks The Kids Are Alright, it was revealed that President Shinra had another illegitimate son with his secretary Annette. His name is Evan Townsend and this makes him the younger half-brother of both Rufus and Lazard. Cloud was one of the first three FF7 characters to be designed, with Aerith and Barrett being the other two originals. Cloud is a deep character and was developed by four members of staff. This includes designer Tetsuya Nomura, producer Yasunori Kitase, scenario writer Kazushiga Najima, and director Hironobu Sakaguchi. In an interview, Najima makes a comparison to Dragon Quest Silent Heroes, where the player is free to become the hero. In the case of Cloud, whose name and past have already been decided, Decided, Najima tried to come up with ways to get the player to empathise with the character. As a result, Cloud's foggy memories were created as a way to introduce the player to the world. Cloud's hair was also originally supposed to be black and slicked back to contrast with Sephiroth's long white hair. This design was also seen as a good way to render less polygons on the screen. However, this design idea was eventually scrapped but later used for Angeal in Crisis Core. There are a couple of well-known bands out there who are clear fans of Final Fantasy VII. American post-hardcore band as Scarlet Drive has multiple references to the Final Fantasy series in the song titles from their debut album, Wires and the Concept of Breathing. 
The song Knights of the Round references the summon. The song All It Takes For Your Dreams To Come True is a quote from President Shinra. And the song This Isn't The End is a quote from Aerith. In addition, the chorus in the song Balance quotes the story of Final Fantasy X. The song I'm Not A Thief, I'm A Treasure Hunter is a quote from Loki in Final Fantasy VI. And the song In The Beginning There Was Void and Pursuit Let's Wisdom Ride The Wind are quotes from Final Fantasy V. American metalcore band Still Remains also shows the love in the song called Avalanche. The lyrics as well as the title are based on Final Fantasy VII. Damn, I love that song. Here's a couple of interesting facts from the Japanese version of Final Fantasy VII. The mayor of Midgar is named Domino and his deputy Hart's original name in the Japanese version is Hut. Domino and Hut refer to the fast food pizza chains and this makes sense as the upper plate in Midgar is at times referred to as a pizza. Also, if you look at the tire of the pickup truck during Cloud and Zack's flashback, you'll see that it says Goodstone. This is a mix of the tire brands Goodyear and Bridgestone. The basement in the Coral Prison seems to be completely useless, but there is a bit of an oddity here. There is a model of a red man in this room, which is hidden from you in normal gameplay. This model isn't seen anywhere else, and it's thought to be a signature from one of the designers. According to the FF7 Ultimania Amiga, Sephiroth's relationship with Aerith was changed numerous times during production. At one point, they were going to be siblings. At another point, lovers. Now kids, that is no way to treat a woman. Nomura also chose to give the two similar hairstyles as a sign of their implied connection. Let's talk about another amazing game, Xenogears. Both of these games actually pay tribute to one another. In Xenogears, there is a poster of Tifa inside one of the citizen sector houses in Solaris. In FF7, after you find Cloud in the hospital, he will mumble some kind of gibberish when you speak to him. One of these lines is Xano Gias, which is a translation error and a reference to the game Xenogears. This spelling is corrected in the PC port of the game. Cloud also says, a billion mirror fragments, small light. And this is a reference to the vocal song of Xenogears, Small Two Pieces. God, I love this song. When walking around the Coral Prison, you may have noticed the letters P, Y, C, K graffitied all over a Shinra sign. Did you ever wonder what this means? Well, there's an uncensored version of this sign that can be seen in some of the concept art which clearly shows the word F I will never look at that sign the same way again. If you thought the FF7 English translation was bad, well, you should check out this Spanish version which is often considered to be one of the worst of all time. Some minor mistakes include mistranslating well for a word that means wheel and hurry for a word that means hooray. But that's not nearly as bad as referring to female characters as males. Mr. Lockhart. Really? There's another couple of doozies in the Gold Sorcerer. Here I come for here I come and who will I participate are two examples here. It also misuses the word party more than often. The most humorous one is a translation that means make a political party of three. Yeah, bear it for president. One thing that many fans don't know is that the North American version of Final Fantasy VII was re-released in Japan titled FF7 International. It contains an exclusive fourth disc titled FF7 Perfect Guide which contains maps, character information, design sketches and loads of other interesting things. As you can see, there is a heap of content that was previously unavailable to fans such as many high-res images of items. Ever want to check out Dio Sexy Mo? Now you can! What about the message that Cloud and Zack scratched into the Mako tanks? Here they are! Ever wonder what the girls look like in the adult magazines? Hmm, this one looks like Tifa. This one doesn't look like Tifa. This one also doesn't look like Barrett. And here's the PMS, I mean PHS. Here's some panties. Here's some orthopedic panties, no joke. Here's some sex clothes. Here's a sex toy, nope, that's the key to the ancients. Speaking of ancients, here's a book that will teach you the Cetra language. This is all pretty awesome stuff. 
Here's a few facts regarding the happiest place on the planet. We've all noticed the ghosts playing chess, as ghosts generally do. The model for this chessboard reveals that the pieces are actually the summons from the game. Yep, a whole city based around mini games was such an amazing idea, and this is something that few games have done since. This is no doubt due to all of the additional programs that would need to be written for each game. The interesting thing here is that when FF7 was in development, Square had staff who had free time between projects as well as some inexperienced new staff. So Square put them all to work and had them code these specialised programs. Losing in the battle arena can suck, at least you get a tissue that can be used to wipe your tears away. Or is it? If you look at the high resolution image of this item, you'll notice that the artwork on it is actually an advertisement for the Honey Bee Inn. I will never look at that tissue the same way. Barrett was a character that Nomura had wanted to create for a very long time. So why did he call him Barrett? This name is a Japanese transliteration of the word bullet. In fact, before FF7 had an English localization, Barrett was referred to as Bullet in some pre-release magazine articles. Barrett's appearance was also changed in Advent Children. His arm gun is different, his hair was restyled, his vest was replaced, and his shirt is also different. This change is because the designers wanted to make him look a little bit less like Mr. T. But I pity the fool and I will destroy any man who tries to take what I got. The funny thing is that the first line he's heard speaking in the movie is, What up, fool? What up, fool? is Barrett. I am the man. Oil cloud. I just found the biggest damn oil field you ever seen. Vincent changed a lot during development. He was originally far more talkative and would go out of his way to flirt with female party members. Some of his concept roles range from detective to horror researcher to chemist. He is also wielding a scythe in some of the early concept art. In the initial detective scenario, Vincent was working on supernatural cases. His job was to investigate Shinra's secrets and expose them to the world. Here, there would have been many flashback scenes relating to Hojo's work, including Hojo kidnapping Lucretia for a Genova experiment and then putting Vincent to sleep for 30 years after he tried to rescue her. When the party found him, Vincent was to have no idea what year it was or even that he had vile experiments done to him. Vincent would even be completely shocked when turning into a monster for the first time. These transformations were intended to be done outside of battle, changing cutscenes depending upon his form. Some of these things would have been awesome to see, but I can't complain considering Vincent and Yuffie were almost cut completely due to time constraints. If you played the 2012 PC release of FF7, you may have noticed a strange name for one of the screens in the Northern Cave. If you plant the save point at a specific location and save, the location will be stated as Secret Cow Level. This is a reference to the Secret Cow Level in Diablo 2. Much of the FF7 compilation takes part in the mighty city of Midgar. Midgar's name is derived from Midgard, which is one of the nine planes in Old Norse mythology. There is a lot of similarities between the two as well. Midgard is considered cut off from the other realms by a great sea and an endless desert, and the same can be said about Midgar, which is surrounded by a desert wasteland. Midgard is crafted by the slain body of King Ymir and this body sustains the city's inhabitants. This sounds a bit like Mako which is drained from the earth and powers the city. Midgard also translates to Middle Earth and is both literally and figuratively in the middle of the eight realms. The Shinra headquarters in the center of Midgar is also surrounded by eight sectors which relates to this central idea. Finally, it is said that during the world ending battle Ragnarok, Midgard will be destroyed and a new world will emerge. You could say this about Edge which is built out of Midgard's runes after it's destroyed during Meteor Fall. Now, let's talk about Aerith's church in Midgar. Did you ever wonder where that rocket came from that crashed through the roof? Well, in an optional dialogue sequence with Sid, he says, That reminds me of a test rocket that landed in the Midgar slums long ago. I remember how relieved I was when I heard it never blew up. Come on Sid, you could have killed Aerith. Who would of course go on to live a long and prosperous life? Now, let's fast forward a bit to Advent Children. Remember that awesome fight sequence between Loz and Tifa? Well, shortly after release, it was duplicated in a music video from Korean pop singer Ivy. The song is titled Sonata of Temptation, and well, it's close to shot for shot at times.
It turns out the music video was banned on TV and singer Ivy was sued by Square Enix. Apparently, it illegally used 80% of Advent Children's storyline, setting, characters, style of dress and character demeanours. 80%! Now that's exact. Now, I'm sure you've all picked this one up, but it's worth mentioning nonetheless. The green-eyed pumpkin located in the gold saucer laughs when you interact with it. This laugh is the same sound clip as Kefka's laugh in Final Fantasy VI, it's just been slowed down a little. I think it's time for some Genova facts. Did you ever play the games Flower or Journey? Well, the designer of those titles, Zing Han Chen, goes by the name of Genova Chen. He stated that he took his name from the character Genova and says that Final Fantasy VII is an influence to his work. When playing the game, you can tell that Genova's helmet has some sort of writing on it, but it's not clear enough to make out. It wasn't until 2005 that a high res image emerged. The text reads, Made in Hong Kong, All Rights Reserved 1996, Square Company Limited. For some reason, it reads differently in Advent Children and Last Order. So, Genova was made in Hong Kong, which is strange considering that there is no Hong Kong in the world of Final Fantasy VII, which is madness! But the madness doesn't stop here, as there are several other real-world references in the game. For starters, Costa del Sol is actually a real location in Spain and is quite a popular tourist destination. The sign above Tifa's bar and the neon sign inside the bar also says Texas. The diner in Wall Market serves Korean barbecue. There is a map of Japan hung on the wall in one of the residents in North Corral. And finally, there's a Shanghai Inn somewhere in Rocket Town, which is obviously a city in China. The play Loveless has posters all over Midgar. Did you know that Loveless is the name of an album by the band My Bloody Valentine? And if you look closely, you'll notice the text My Bloody Valentine is found on the posters. I wonder how they got that advertising deal. We are currently smack in the middle of the FF7 Remake Trilogy, but the fact is, in 2005, there was an unofficial remake for the Famicom by Chinese company Shenzhen Nanjing Technology. The plot is pretty much the same as the original, except for several large sections that were cut. For instance, all of the weapons and huge materia plot points were skipped. The good news is that in April 2011, a developer named Lugia2009 released an English patch for the game including many graphical improvements, new soundtracks and upgraded gameplay. Final Fantasy games tend to have loads of allusions to the respective numbers. FF7 is no different, with the number 7 being very prevalent in the game. Here are a few of the many. Avalanche resides in Sector 7 of Midgar. Tifa's bar is called 7th Heaven. The books in the Shinra Mansion library shelves form the numerals 7. The red plane in the Costa del Sol Harbor has 7 painted on the side. The gold saucer has 7 areas of attractions. The Turtles Paradise awards 7 items for completing the Flyer Hunt side quest. Aerith and Athelna were held captive by Hojo for 7 years. It's been 7 years since Cloud left Nibelheim to join Soldier. Red 13 tells the party that Meteor will reach the planet in 7 days. Cloud levels up to 7 in the first battle. If a unit's HP hits 7777, during the battle, they'll enter all Lucky 7 status. The Lucky Handicap Rail on the battle square is called Lucky 7. Whew, that was tiring. I need a nap. Final Fantasy VII is loved by millions around the world, so it's only natural that some of the love is shown in other media. In the TV show Coconut Fred's Fruit Salad Island, Cloud and Sephiroth are both humorously depicted. Sir Nuttalot will be banished from Fruit Salad Island forever! The Cartoon Network show Steven Universe also plays tribute to the game. Here, the main character Steven plays with a cloud action figure. Then, the character Hollow Pearl impales the cloud figure in the same manner as Sephiroth did during the Nibelheim incident. And ever watch Robot Chicken? This adult swim show has Cloud, Tifa, Yuffie, Barrett, Aerith, and Sephiroth as employees at a burger chain. Even cooler is that one winged angel plays during Sephiroth's entrance, with the lyrics altered to hamburger. Come on, come on. 
Here are some fun facts about the Parentals. In some early concept art, Cloud's mum is named Claudia Strauss and is said to be 33 years old. In another piece of concept art, Tifa's dad is given the name of Brian Lockhart and is said to be 40 years old. The thing is, it wasn't until the FF7 remake that these characters were finally given these official names. Previously, they were simply referred to as Cloud's mum and Tifa's father. In Crisis Core, many people were led to believe that this woman near Cloud's house was in fact Cloud's mum due to their similarities. However, this theory was then completely debunked after the character was redesigned in FF7 Crisis Core Reunion. Now here's a few facts about our favourite four-legged party member, Red 13. Have you noticed that he is nearly always seen from the left, which is the side of his good eye? This includes FMVs, his menu portrait, Advent Children, the ending of Dirge of Subarus, and even almost all of his concept art. Red 13's real name, Nanaki, was chosen because it has a Native American sound to it, fitting in with the whole Cosmo Canyon culture. Character designer Nomura chose the name Red 13 simply by combining a colour with a number. He wanted him to have a name that didn't sound like a name. Mission well done. According to Nomura, including Red 13 into the original game was a struggle as he wouldn't easily be able to climb ladders and when he turned his tail, his body would end up going through walls. But the struggles didn't stop here. You may have noticed that Red 13 has very little screen time in Advent Children and Dirge of Subarus. This is because his fur made him so difficult and costly to animate. Man, dogs are so much work. Originally, Red 13 was planned to be the focus of a detailed subplot, but this was cut. Originally, there were to be two Red 13 clones created by Hojo called Cobalt 14 and Indigo 15. These clones were to be fought in battle. Once defeated, Red 13 would have the party spare their lives as after himself, they were the last of his kind. But it wasn't to be a happy ending. These clones were assholes and would return to the Northern Cave as cyborgs determined to prove they were superior to Red 13. In my opinion, the FF7 logo is one that sticks out for me more than any other. Logo illustrator Yoshitaka Amano described creating the FF7 logo as a challenge. As you can see, he drew many variations of the logo around the Meteor motif. In the end, he wasn't sure if it was good, so he let the developers choose the final version. Obviously, they went with the green and blue version, as these colours set the theme for the rest of the game as they reflected Mako energy and the live stream, which play crucial roles in the story. Personally, I would have gone for this one. Moai are large human-like figures carved from rocks. These statues are located on Easter Island and have been there since the 1200s. It seems that some of the developers have a thing for these statues. Did you know that they appear in multiple Final Fantasy games as hidden Easter eggs? And if you're wondering, they have no purpose whatsoever. Here's a couple of them hidden in Final Fantasy VII. The honeybee in scenes were quite controversial. A huge amount of content was actually cut from this section prior to release. This content can actually be found in the data of the original Japanese release but has since been removed from all other versions. I could seriously make an entire video on this but here's a nutshell version of what was going to be. For starters, it was possible for Cloud to encounter Palmer coming from one of his regular bath sessions if you know what I mean. There was also a waiting room, a lobby and an employee's lounge where players could visit and interact with NPCs. This lobby had different girls displayed on the TV screen. Some of the texts included information on the courses that they offer and had slogans like Chat with beautiful women, welcome to my nest and how about some honey? There was even a sign on the wall that forbids entry for other brothel owners, scouts and miners and also a sign that warns that poaching hostesses leads to a 100,000 gil fine. In an interview, Najima stated that at first what took place in the inn was much more extreme and that all staff was saying that's going too far. Here's some other interesting content that was cut for unknown reasons. A Final Fantasy VII pre-release image shows the high wind on the world map. Below it, there is a house that doesn't exist in the final game. This was to be situated between Calm and the Chocobo Farm. It's unknown whether the house was put there just for the screenshot or if it was an actual location planned for the game. And we've all probably noticed this inaccessible cave. In the last screen of the sleeping forest that leads to the forgotten capital, a clear ledge with a cave can be seen with a vine hanging from it. The vine is obviously for the player to climb. There's even 
even a detour to the vine, but despite this, it cannot be interacted with. By the time that FF7 came around, chocobos had been around for a while, but where did the name chocobo actually come from? Chocobo is derived from a Japanese brand of chocolate malt ball, the Choco Ball. I seriously don't know what to say about the advert for said delicious treat. Take a look. To be completely honest, this is probably one of the catchiest tunes I've ever heard in my life. Can you even imagine what my brain is going through right now while editing and hearing this track over and over again? But the craziness doesn't stop here, don't you worry about that. The mascot for this product is named Kyoro-chan, who is a ridiculous looking bird that says Kwa. Somehow, it even got its own anime series. The international version of FF7 saw quite a few differences from the Japanese version. Here's a few of the interesting ones. Firstly, the number of available spaces for character names was increased from 6 to 9. This was to accommodate for longer names like Vincent and Sephiroth. The diamond weapon was made into a boss rather than just appearing in a cutscene. During this fight, you can steal Yuffie's rising sun weapon, which was unused in the Japanese version. Believe it or not, but the emerald and ruby weapon super bosses were also not present in the original Japanese version. So naturally, the guidebook, the desert rose, and the earth harp also didn't exist. Finally, the Temple of the Ancients clock puzzle removed the more complicated version that was found from the original Japanese version. International players were instead given a much more simplified version from the start. In the Japanese version, you had to fail three times to get this simplified version. It goes without saying that Cloud and Sephiroth are very iconic video game characters. The imagery and design concepts of these characters were based off the famous samurai rivals of the late Sengoku period, Miyamoto Musashi and Sasaki Kojiro. There's also a limited edition cold car statue of Cloud and Sephiroth's final showdown. This was modelled after the statue depicting the duel between these legendary samurai. Now let's take a look at the one track to rule them all, One Winged Angel. Yeah, it's incredible, but did you know that the lyrics in the original FF7 version and the version heard in Advent Children are different? I'll play both of them with both the Latin and English translations. So, we've just heard the one track to rule them all, now it's time for the one spoiler to rule them all. Here's some history behind this tragic event. Tetsuya Nomura stated that he was frustrated with the perennial cliché where the protagonist loves someone very much but has to sacrifice himself and die in a dramatic fashion to express that love. He identified this happening far too often in North American and Japanese media. He and the other developers believed that in the real world things are very different. Death comes suddenly and there is no notion of good or bad. When you lose someone you loved very much, you feel this big empty space and think, if I had known that was coming, I would have done things differently. These are the feelings of reality, not Hollywood, and this is what the developers wanted to arouse in the players with Aerith's early death. In reflection, Nomura comments that the fact that fans were so offended by her sudden death probably means that they were successful with her character. If fans had simply accepted her death, that would have meant she wasn't an effective character. Words of truth. I often don't care when characters die in games, unless the awesome equipment that they had equipped dies with them. To be fair, at least it was only Aerith. During the writing of the script, the development team were discussing the possibility of killing off nearly the entire cast of playable characters with only three surviving. However, this was later scrapped as they felt it would dilute the meaning of Aerith's death. This death was a staple in video game storytelling. The event is even referred to in Wreck-It Ralph. When Ralph is entering Game Central Station, graffiti can be seen spray painted on the walls near the entrance. The graffiti reads, Aerith lives. 
The village of Wutai has some interesting origins. Mount Wutai is a real mountain located in China and translates to Five Plateau Mountain. This could have something to do with the five bosses that you encounter in the Wutai Pagoda. Speaking of which, all of these bosses have some interesting links to theatre. Godot's name is based off Godot, the title character from Samuel Beckett's famous play Waiting for Godot. Gorky's name is a reference to Maxim Gorky, the 19th century Russian author, playwright and political activist. Chekhov is named after Anton Chekhov, who was a Russian playwright and short story writer. He is considered among the greatest writers of short fiction in history. Stanit is short for Konstantin Stanislavski. He was a Russian theatre practitioner who was widely recognised as an outstanding character actor. Then finally, the Sheikh, whose name references the great William Shakespeare. Yeah, he's only widely regarded as the greatest writer in the English language. The intention for these characters was that they would speak in a different way based on their origin, but this speech is completely missed in the English translation. Knights of the Round is one of the most badass summons in the entire series. It also has the longest summon animation in Final Fantasy VII. It is an incredible move, so you're going to want to use it a lot, but this could take up quite a bit of your precious time. Did you know that this sequence, as with every other battle ability animation, can be skipped with Vincent's mug glitch? As you would expect, this glitch involves Vincent using the mug command. Whenever he does so, the next attack animation is skipped, be it the enemy's or the player's attack. The damage is still calculated as normal, even if no damage numbers appear. This ability works with Vincent's short barrel, Winchester, long barrel R, sniper CR and death penalty. If you're familiar with King Arthur, you'll know that there were many Knights of the Round Table, so which ones were present in the summon animation? Well, the final knight that makes the grand entrance and attack is none other than King Arthur himself. We know this because this particular knight was released as a figure as part of the first Final Fantasy Creatures set. Everything else is just speculation, such as the second and third last knight being Gawain and Lancelot due to the weapons that they wield. Cup Noodle advertising was pretty damn evident in Final Fantasy XV, but this wasn't the first time Square decided to partner with instant noodle companies. To celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Final Fantasy series, Cup Noodle Company Nissan created 30 limited edition forks inspired by Cloud's Ultima weapon. So how did you win one? Simply purchase a special box set of the Final Fantasy themed cup noodles then enter the draw. It should also be noted that these can't really be used for eating as they are a massive 24 inches in length. But all the same, I would love to add one of these to my collection. Wow, now that was a lot of facts. It still blows my mind. After all of these years, I'm still learning something new about the series. What about you? Did you enjoy this video? What facts did you find the most interesting? Let me know in the comments below. This was Hellfire RPGs. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, it would help me out a lot to hit like and sub for more FF and JRPG content coming soon. See you next time.